I yeah. gave Andy the rock garden for tonight. You gave him the what? The rock garden for tonight. Oh, Show her your rock garden, Andy. Did you go on the field trip? I did not. You ready? <laughs> Is everybody here ready to get started? Rob? Rob? Are we ready? Yep, he, he just... All right. Welcome, everybody. 6.01 p.m. Tuesday, March 20th to the public hearing for the Mount Greylock Regional School District, the brand new pre-K through 12 Regional School District. Um, we're going to immediately move to a presentation of the FY19 budget by Interim Superintendent Kimberly Grady, Business Manager Andy Paquette, Principal Mary McDonald, Principal Joelle Bruckner, Principal Marty McAvoy. Welcome. Do you do you want me to fill some time while the projectors light up? <laughs> you filled it. Are you what are you making? Okay. Maybe you'll finish it tonight. They're coming. Yep. I think I see the mountain range. Yep, there it goes. This one's coming out. Feels up. It's all yours. That, that one will get brighter, right? It will, yes. It just needs Great. to warm up. So welcome, everybody. Um, tonight I have with us the um, the three building principals, the business manager, and the transition committee who we have worked to present to you the, the um, first pre-K to 12 regional school budget. Um, we've been working over the last eight years together on lots of things with our shared service arrangement and as you can see the Williamstown and Lanesboro Elementary School mission is um, mirrored at both schools to inspire all students to love the students a love of learning and challenge them to grow in heart and mind. Mount Greylock um, has the Greylock way which its premise is on responsibility, perseverance and integrity. Our foundations for success, and that's really um, based on you know what we've been able to accomplish with the budgets that we've had in the years um, past. So broad, diverse programming to meet a wide variety of needs and interests, maintaining a commitment to the arts, low student-teacher ratio, partnerships with multiple institutions and organizations to expand opportunities for students, level one schools as determined by MCAS, a commitment to supporting 21st century technology and education. When we look at building the budget, we look at several areas, more, most importantly our curricular and co-curricular program developments. We look at what we need to um, hit the mark for all students pre-K to 12. So our state standards and requirements for graduation and admissions to the mass state college and universities. We examine data. We look at MCAS, Advanced Placement, AccuPlacer, SATs, PSATs, ACTs. We have conversations with stakeholders and community partners, faculty and staff, student surveys, school councils, finance subcommittee, community partners, parent-teacher organization, Friends of the Arts, the Booster Clubs, college and universities, admissions and academics department. Year one. <laughs> this is a one-time transition year and these are the bullet points in this slide really are just what we had to do this year as we go forward to build the first budget. So transitioning to our regional school district presenting multiple schools, learning new apportionment calculations, merging our chart of accounts, moving some light items between the town budget and the regional school district budget. So we're there. We've done these things. <laughs> the new apportionment. MGRS cost apportioned as in years past, and the towns cover 100% of the local elementary school costs. We have top line expenditures for each school are presented, then offset by use of revenues and revolvers. Chapter 70 revenue is a special case because it, is, it now comes in lump sum to the regional school district. It is then apportioned to the schools by a formula that mimics the state's approach. 
Net spending needs are apportioned in the following manner. Each town's minimal local contribution is split and applied across MGRS and the local elementary schools based on percentage of the foundation enrollment at each, gr each grade group. Needs above minimum local contribution are apportioned according to 100% of elementary school, a portion of the middle high school MGRS needs is indicated by the five-year trailing average of pew purple, pew purple, per pupil percentages as before. Changes to the charts of account. So as we were building our budget and we were working on Munis and Softright and Budget Sense here, um, Andy, the business manager and his team decided they were just going to pull the Band-Aid off on us all together and merge to the updated chart of accounts for DESE. So all the changes that you're going to see are this one time through and next year it'll be streamlined to the DESE function codes and chart of accounts and everything will be back in harmony. So a common, uh, a common set of rows unifying budget language across the schools will aid in streamlining business office functions, communication between the schools, understanding of school committee and community, classifying um, according to the DESE function codes, DESE function codes equals de DESE recommended chart of accounts, common language for payable on up to the DESE reporting, improves ability to benchmark with other schools, end result, better informed decisions by reducing clutter and increase, increasing clarity. Then we have the movements between the town and the school budgets. So the regional school district becomes destination for state funds, chapter 70 grants, et cetera, related to the elementary schools. Town budgets, re retiree contribution for elementary school employees will re who retire prior to July 1. Regional school district owns for employees who retire after. In the case of Lanesboro, health insurance moves to the regional school budget. End result this year, appropriated funds won't be as apples to apples percentage change, but this is a one-time complexity. So other FY18 to 19 changes to report. Health insurance. We are not looking at a 15% 15 increase as we have in years past. The health insurance group has, we have steady premiums flat for FY19. The, the splits of those of the insurance though, that is um, in the hands of our negotiating team. Salaries, all union negotiations are in progress, started in January, pushing to get clarity. Top three administrators interim this year, permanent for next year to be determined in April <coughs> and May. So that is just the business manager, myself, and the SPED director are all interim in our roles for 18, with the hopes that we'll have permanent people in place come July 1 of 19. I'm sorry, July 1 of 18. Changes to the two town demographics that impact the apportionment of Mount Gray Lake Regional School operating and capital. Then we have our enrollments compared 18 to 19. This um, is our pre-K to 12 landscape. So although it's showing projected numbers to be three students less, our pre-K and K numbers are really in flux at this time. We're just, we're doing the pre-K pre -K and K registrations. Um, and I know that K registrations went on today. So, Joelle, do you have a more definitive K number for Wes? No, I do not. Okay, just checking. <laughs> so, Andy, you're up to start talking numbers for me. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I guess I'll be going through the boring stuff. Um, this here, uh, what we're doing here now is a, f a first comparison of the operating and capital budgets for 18 and 19. This is one attempt at doing the apples to apples comparison. Um, if you look at the note regarding the gross operating in FY18, what we included in the FY18 was uh, at the, uh, the Department of Education requires that we file an end of the year report regarding expenditures and including that we have to provide a projected budget for the next fiscal year. So we included what are called, you know, in-kind or town-related expenses that are presented to us by the town officials for inclusion into the report that we submit to the state. So that's where you get that comparison, the, the gross comparison between 18 and 19 with a 19 gross operating budget of 22,447,601. Then we have the capital, and uh, we actually just had a meeting this morning with the finance advisor, and everybody should feel good about the fact that, according to him, the 
borrowing uh, with the cash flow projections that we have is on target. So uh, that number should not be a surprise to those that were very involved in that that debt number, the gross capital 1.957325. Uh, is right on with what it is that we were planning and seem to be going according to plan for the remainder of the project. That gives us a gross total budget for FY19 of $24,404,926. Here's uh, the breakdown. And this again, where we start to get to this one time pain. Uh, we're comparing the Chapter 70 aid that. Mount Greylock Regional and FY18 received to what it is that now we're getting in FY19 as a pre-combined K-12. So that's why you see the, the significant increase in the Chapter 78 of the 1,767,122. Uh, so go ahead. Just, just so that the people, the, the number to the far right is what our revenues for Williamstown Elementary School and Lanesboro Elementary Schools that will be coming into the region. So this Yes, they're off the cherry sheets for Correct. the town. Correct. And Chapter 71, uh, that number is what uh, all these numbers for FY19 uh, that were coming that come from the cherry sheet are based off of House 2. Uh, that's uh, up 13,600. And then we had a projection for Medicaid reimbursement of what use, was used or projected for in FY18 with what's in FY19 for an increase of 80,796. For a budgeted amount of 105,796, and for transfer from E and D, we uh, feel comfortable that we could use 240,000. That's it's a $5,000 reduction from last this current fiscal year's E and D use. Um, I think it's worthy to take a time right now to say that um, we are we revise this practically daily, if not hourly. It seems um, these numbers could change. But what we're doing here tonight is giving you, you know, as close to what we know as of right now, uh, as it, those that are following regional school district regulations know, um, after a public hearing and a vote of the school committee, you cannot raise the appropriation. You can only lower it. So uh, the goal will be obviously as we fine tune things and get more information, a potential lowering of these things. So. I just, I just want, want to touch on E&D because it is always a question from others in the audience and the viewing public. So our end of year balance that was verified for Mount Greylock Regional School District as it existed as a 7 to 12 on 7117 was $566,503. Our cap on that at the time was $597,000. Um, we're projecting to use in the 18 budget the $245,000 with a balance uh, for 630 and this is just projected balance because we know that we're going to have a, a small return from the health insurance um, and then any other unused funds from the appropriated budget potentially will roll into here. So our goal is to continue to keep at that 4.85% not going over 5% um, as we prepare for the first note for the building project that we'd be looking at in July. So comfortably have the revenues in there even with the request for um, estimated use for the 19 budget. Again, more information regarding revenue projections. The charter tuition reimbursement, uh, that again is from the cherry sheet, and that is slightly down from 18. We, our regular tuition projection, uh, that is up for high school, yes, correct. For high school is up, uh, and then we're projecting using more school choice of $72,348 for a total of those funding sources of 1.4 million, which is an overall increase of additional funding sources of $156,064. Then we have non-appropriated. <clears throat> this is the William College Fund uh, for the high school only. It's 200,000. Grants and revolving accounts, we're projecting to use more of those to the tune and combined of 654,530 and circuit breaker also using more uh, with a projected use of $389,438. So those are all the funding sources where when you look at where that gross budget was that we are reducing to get down to what it is that ultimately the net assessments for the towns would be. 
and here we go. Again, this uh, comparison is somewhat misleading, uh, but in the interest of the comparing, uh, we are looking at the gross total budget of the 24.4 million with projected revenues of 6.8 million. That gives us down to a total net assessment of 17,597,469. And it's again, the increase from just the region to now full K-12 is a $8,035,650. We have the allocation of the assessments by the towns comparing 18 and 19. And so you see Lanesboro's at 5,788,394. Williamstown 11809075 for the total assessment of the 17597469. Little different look at it, another layer if you will down. This is the operating budget again for the comparison 18 to 19 uh, for an attempt to show the apples to apples. You get a bottom net total of 18 of 16.6 million with the comparison FY19 of the 15 million 640.144. And then the operating assessments for the operating budgets. You look and see we have Lanesboro's operating assessment of 5,172,823, Williamstown 10,467,322. Uh, both of those, again, comparable to just the region last year for FY18 are up significantly with a, that's okay, that's okay. 15,641.45. The capital assessment portion, again, this year, and all these are based on uh, the calculations per the regional agreement uh, and the, the Debt and interest of the 1957 325. It's up 186,750, and you have the breakdown of the towns respectively with Williamstown at 1,341,754 and Lanesboro 615,571. Here is our assessments again by town of the 5,788,394. That's both operating and capital in a Williamstown 11809075 for the total assessments of 17597469. So the implications for our budget, what we have <coughs> for the numbers that were presented tonight, um, we were able to maintain staffing to meet the needs of all students at Lanesboro Elementary School maintains programming and supports school improvement plan. At Williamstown, it maintains staffing to support student, st student success, increases access to technology, bring one-to-one -one access for students to a level equal to what Lanesboro and Mount Greylock, <coughs> equip classrooms that currently have obsolete hardware, and it reinstates Shakespeare and Company, Math Club, and Lego Robotics. At Mount Greylock, we're looking to add a, provide a school adjustment counselor to support all students and specifically the rising number of students with anxiety disorders and those in need of alternative education programs. Expand performing arts co-curricular funding to increase the middle school, middle school engagement and expand opportunities for high school students and supports the return of a school resource officer for several hours across the week. So I can put up the budget pa pages so that if they have specific questions, we can kind of navigate it that way. Okay. Sounds great. So for people who have uh, questions. Sure. Thanks. Yep. So within this circle right now, questions, comments? I have two questions. Kim, if you could... Go back, or Andy, the the E and D numbers. I didn't quite catch them. Um, so we used two hundred forty thousand out of two forty five this 245. year. Two forty five. We're looking to do two hundred forty for FY nineteen. Okay, and what's the balance then in E and D? The projected balance. Mm -hmm. All things go yep. according to yep. plan. As of the end of next fiscal year, yep. using a two forty would be four hundred forty four thousand three hundred nine dollars. Okay. 
and so one of the questions that often comes up is why are we raising um, why are we why aren't we using more E&D to offset the impact to the town because we're getting ready to um, to seek an, a note for the building project here at the re the 712 mm -hmm. and so our E&D for that note is going to be based on close to a 5% cap here so we're it's becoming a region is is tricky when the first note we have to seek is early July mm -hmm. so not I can't afford to draw it all down because we have to I, when we had met today we have to provide what are the two sheets you had to provide him continuing disclosure and uh, trial balance and a statement of revenue and expenses mm -hmm. so part of yeah I was just going to say, um, we, I know that we had tried to keep it, the END as high as we yep. could when we went out for the bond, yes. right? So we're in that position now. Again. So I think it's just good to remind people that there is a reason we're maintaining a high END as high as we can because right. we need to and maintain our credit. And I would say it's no different than municipalities trying mm -hmm. to keep their stabilization and free cash as a high as allowable because it just helps their bond rating as well. Right. Yeah. And, and it's also analogous to for an individual taking out a, a loan, you know, showing that you're in strong financial shape um, contributes to getting a lower interest rate and uh, easier time in the market. So it's all tied to the same thing. We, we did, I think it's also worth noting that there's a, there was a question out there of um, once we are pre-K through 12, is, is our, you know, our E&D capacity will expand significantly pre-K through 12, That's because right. all of a sudden we'll have larger um, financials to be able to, to run that E&D cap against. But for the purpose of borrowing, we are going to be able to view the 7 through 12 portion as, um, as its own little silo, so it's not as though all of a sudden people are going to say, well, why don't you have more in the bank? Your, um, your net expenditures, your net revenue is, is so much higher now. Um, it will remain for the life of this project isolated to that portion, which is helpful. So our, hmm. our END, it isn't as though all of a sudden next year we need to figure out how to have a ton of, of um, END available in order to show the same level of financial strength <coughs> that will be right. cordoned off. But. My other question was about grants and revolving. Um, you said we were using more from grants and revolving. Can you just explain that a little bit more? So we have new revolver accounts that will be coming up from the elementary school. Um, that will be offsetting the well for the you know the elementary school budgets they'll be being utilized to offset our grants are what they are so um, so we're using obviously 100% of what we receive with you know the anticipated reduction for year one until they and it could they could have it all together and when we go to apply for our grants our numbers may not be reduced but mm -hmm. when we were preparing the budgets and I had questioned how should I plan the standard practice for them is 5 to 15. We should be looking at reductions anyway because that's just natural practice. But if I took the 15 off of every school, which we did, we came in low, um, our grant amounts coming in could be higher. Mm -hmm. But it's not it's nothing I could have a definitive on. Yep. But we're bringing in new revolvers from the elementary schools that will be offsetting their budgets. Thanks. Anything else? All right. So members of the public if you have any questions that you'd like uh, answered if you could um, file on up along the side rather than the middle and then curl up um, come up to this microphone that we have set up here um, let us know your name um, hometown and uh, if you could keep your your question to one or two minutes that would be great so we can keep on moving through the agenda and make sure everybody's questions get answered <laughs> oh, Step on up. Am I supposed to sit down? Uh, I feel like I'm in the principal's office. Sure. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions. Oh, One, can uh, you? Uh, yeah. Name and time. Name and time. We, we, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Michelle Johnson, Lanesboro. Thank Not you. my first time here. Um, can you explain a little bit how the whole new Ashford tuition thing is factoring into this budget? I'm not totally clear on how we can come up with a budget without having a a d definitive number on this a pretty big number we for do not have a tuition amount factored into this budget so so what will happen to that money when it comes in when it comes in it would offset if it comes in before the town meeting and we can revote the budget on this end it will reduce what's assessed back to Lanesboro okay and um, 
sort of related to that is I know that you're currently in negotiations. So um, I know there's going to, nobody's going to get less of a salary, if I remember correctly from the That's regionalization. Correct. But there likely could be people who are getting a higher salary. Mm -hmm. Will that be assessed by town or is that going to come out of one giant pool? So like, let's say, for example, there's a teacher at Williamstown who needs to make $3,000 more a year. Does that get assessed by town or is that in one big pool? So it's by school. Yep, so, so salaries are, are, are listed within this budget by the building in which those salaries are incurred and paid. Okay. So if somebody at Lanesboro Elementary School was receiving $3,000 more next year, mm -hmm. that would be indicated within the Lanesboro assessment because the way the money is broken down um, that makes sense. It would end up being a part of the Lansbury Elementary School. So on the slide that's up, Michelle, it's yeah. so if you look at instructional, so the 2000 series, so it's D7 on the screen. Okay. That that accounts for that, the, the, the row across accounts for the instructional salaries. Okay, just, but that's. At all three schools. That's so for you're, all three schools. Yeah, so you're seeing 18, 19 comparisons. So yeah. that's where you would see it offset and it would hit to the individual school. Okay. Um, and along those same lines, does this budget include, for Lanesboro specifically, there are a couple of grades, a couple of sections in Lanesboro that are getting a smidge bigger than I'm personally comfortable with. So I'm curious what kind of staffing changes are or are not being considered in this, this exact budget. So this was level staffed. So the existing staff at Lanesboro, this is what this budget was built on. Okay, so I believe it's what, first and fourth grade. Marty, am I right about that? Uh, two. Currently yeah. have two grades? No, you have, there, there, I can't remember which section. <laughs> We're almost out of elementary school, so. <laughs> but I, I know I've heard tell that there's what, 25 and one, and I forget how many in the other. But you have two rather large class sizes, is that right? Well, we have, we're keeping level staff and, and the numbers, the student numbers are consistent Fine. next year with this year. So okay. we would next year we would have um, two kindergartens, two first grades, two uh, one second grade, <coughs> one third grade, one fourth grade, no, two, two, two fifth grades, grades. Two second grades. oh two second grades. I'm sorry, because the two first grades is going up. That's going to be two second grades. All right, so two, two, and two up to the second grade. What do you have for third? Third grade we have um, one, one third grade for next year. And how many are in that class? Right now, if it started today, we would have 20. 20 if it started today? Like we have 20 in the class today. Currently, okay. What That's your four? current second grade. Right. That's yeah. our current yeah. second grade. And that includes two tuition students that may or may not. Um, we have 25 third graders currently. That's what I was thinking of. Okay. That would be one class next year, one fourth grade. We have two fifth grades currently. That would still be two fifth grades. We have two sixth grades currently. Next year would still be two sixth grades. Okay. So there, we don't have any concerns about the 25 student class? That's a little bigger than I'd like to see, but given the parameters of the budget, it's the best I could do. Okay. Jennifer Szymanski. Um, I teach fourth grade at Lanesboro Elementary School. Um, so the 25 in fourth grade is the reason that I'm here to talk. And um, I'm, I, I'm sure that it looks awfully self-serving for the fourth grade teacher to talk about that group of 25. But in 23 years that I've been teaching, I've only come before, before this type of committee once. I am alarmed that 25 nine-year-olds are going to be in my classroom or a fourth grade classroom. Um, and the entire history of fourth grade at the current building has never had 25. Now, I know we can go back and look at the history and by the time the kids get to sixth grade, we do have bigger classes and there have been classes of 27. But with the expectation that is on fourth grade 
the expectation on these nine-year-old kids to meet state standards in a class of 25 is difficult. As elementary school teachers, we handle it. We are dealt the hand that we are dealt. We, we deal with it. We handle it. I don't want to just handle it. I feel like right now is our opportunity to plan for something better. I expect my students to plan when they write. Can't we plan for something better? Splitting fourth grade and accepting school choice into that class would make two smaller classes that could meet the needs of these kids. 25 is a really high number. <laughs> and I know that in another elementary school in our district, there are not 25 kids in fourth grade. And we're sending the kids to the same place and expecting the same progress and we're expecting the same result and it's going to be really hard. Now, I'm again, elementary school teacher, I handle it. I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm going to, and every elementary school teacher in my position would handle that. But why would we set it up so that it could be a problem? Especially right now, it's spring. People could move in over the summer. Let's just accept, accept school choice and split the classes. I don't know if I am asking the question or if I'm just saying what I need to say, but I think I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, now, I expect that the, the topic will come up during the during our deliberations on the budget here shortly. But I, I don't think there was a, a set question that we can answer here within the next few seconds. But yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm Anna Mello and I'm the third grade teacher in Leansboro and I just want to back up my, my colleague here. I just went through this with 25 students. When I started at Leansboro Elementary I had two classes of 28 and two classes of 40. I taught sixth grade and fifth grade. At that point it was before MCAS. It was perfectly fine. We could do it. I've managed it this year. I'm piecemealing things constantly. I'm grabbing every single volunteer I can find. It is less than ideal trying to get someone from second to fourth grade. So I do, I would really love for you guys to think about this seriously. I'm wondering what is the cutoff number in Williamstown before you break into another class? We have ideal sizes, but we don't have cutoffs. The teacher's contract currently says 24. Okay. And may I ask what number do you have in your <coughs> state? What's your biggest class right now? 22. 22. Okay. And they, but they've gotten bigger. I mean, we've had up to 24. Yeah. Yeah. But most of them are smaller. At this developmental age, I know they're, I know they're larger classes in seventh and eighth grade, but at this age when you're teaching them basic math, basic writing, just something, please think about what my colleague just said as we go forward. We know money is tight, but, you know, let's give them every opportunity to thrive. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> well, I told myself I wasn't going to talk. <laughs> Here I am. I'm Jen Deshane. I'm from Waynesboro. Um, I just have a few questions, I guess. Has school choice been set yet for next year? Yes. So that obviously won't be done until you know what New Ashford's doing. Is that correct? I'd imagine. We, we, we will be choice. Go ahead. We will be voting choice this evening. Oh, okay. All right. So um, with New Ashford not being figured in, is that going to create more spots? I'm, I'm, I don't know. It's, it's important to note that, that we're going to be voting opening up a certain number of choice slots tonight. Okay. And that if we so choose, we can always open additional, additional. slots as we All go right. through the next couple of months. So that's technically that's possible. Okay. Um, whether or not 
it happens mm -hmm. is a totally separate yeah. question. In this whole new Ashford thing, throwing everything off, I guess, in my head. Um, so if they, if you guys decide to take them in at whatever you agree upon, and that's going to bring in more money, would that possibly fund another teacher it will for all, third grade? So right now we're drawing fourth, down yeah. a large fourth number grade. of choice. Okay. Um, so it wouldn't fund because it would uh, it would ha we would be looking to offset it it's offset the budget oh, okay. in the past from the town side All right. so they're going to anticipate that the revenues are used to offset the local school lanesboro okay, as revenue i was just hoping with the whole regionalization thing and i think it's awesome that we passed it that we would have the same stand hold our school to the same standards that well i know we're not williams sound i don't live in williams sound i'm not moving to williams sound but um we would have, you know, the smaller class sizes that they have. That's all I have to say. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else going once, going twice? And we're going to move past the public Q&A session. Um, which means we're going to close the public hearing here at 6.36 p.m. Um, we can't open till 7. And we cannot open our the rest of our open session or our open session agenda until... We didn't? Okay. It doesn't? Oh, okay. Good, I thought it was. That was Great, moving right along. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, so I'm going to call this open session to order of the Mount Greylock Regional School District Transition Committee. Can you wait five seconds so I can tell something to Al? Pardon? Can you just wait five seconds so I can tell something to Al about signing things? Sure. Al, you just need to use a point signature. Um. So we're going to call to order at 6.37 p.m. Tuesday, March 20th, um, the open session uh, for the Mount Greylock Regional School District Transition Committee. Um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from March 15, 2018. Um, would somebody like to move a motion to accept those minutes? Also move. May I get a second? <coughs> I'll second. All right. Uh, comments, questions? Without any. Um, all in favor to accept the minutes? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. And now we move on to a bittersweet moment within the agenda. Um, the farewell to, to Sheila Hebert, not, not farewell period, but farewell for many years of extraordinary service to um, Lanesboro Elementary School, to Mount Greylock, to the regionalization effort, to the building project effort, to just about everything that has impacted our towns and education for many, many years. Um, I don't know if other people who, who have been serving recently with with, Car I mean with Sheila would like to um, say anything, but the floor is certainly open I if you'd like to. I'll, I'll just say on behalf of the town of Lanesboro that Sheila has been, along with Regina, a real steady influence in, in our town and in you know, Lanesboro Elementary School in Mount Greylock for a long time now, and uh, she deserves the town's thanks and, and uh, well, both town's thanks and, and our thanks as well. So we'll miss you, Sheila, and thank you very much. Come on up. Yeah, well, come on down. Mount Greylock Regional School District. We also have T-shirts from each school for you. Thank you. Wine glasses from the Birch's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all your Thank you very much. Thank you. Sheila, no, no speeches or anything like that? <laughs> no. <laughs> all, right. all right. All right. Um, so next item on the agenda, school choice openings for 2018-2019. Um, the, uh, one of the, one of the parting wishes from our last meeting last week, um, uh, was to include the, uh, approximate class size, um, 
resulting from all, all the decisions and potential decisions current year and uh, next year. Um, that is that went out in the packet. It is available here. Um, were there any any updated comments? I mean, a, a lot of our discussion last week centered around um, uncertainty within the, the, the K classes as well as you know, anything else related to that? Do, do we have anything else that we want to add to the discussion before we get going on it? Or, Joelle? I can just say we had another day of kindergarten registration. Um, we've now found more students. Um, so our list, we had 41 on the census list. We now have 58 students who are around in the world. Um, 31 have registered. 11 are siblings of students we currently have, residents, who I know will register. So we're waiting on 16. So I'm still very confident in the four sections. And I'm still OK with the recommendation for four choice slots. Because it will keep us still in uh, hovering around 60, which 60, 61, 62, 63, I'm okay with. If we collapse that then to three sections. All right. Other? Um, I have a question. Marty, um, if we did entertain the idea of splitting the class, we've heard a lot about, what, what are our, pro well, two questions on it. Do we have new Ashford students in that class that may not be there next year? And two, um, what are our chances of getting choice in that class? Uh, you don't have the choice applications yet, or do we? Or not, not yet, right? Not yet. No. So we don't know if people will actually apply for that class if we were to split it? That's correct. What's our history been at that grade level um, in terms of choice? Ten minutes. I mean, it could, you get, you get a few. A few. It's not it's not, <coughs> really, it's not as a short thing as the earlier grades, for sure, but you could get, a, you could get some. We have one. One New Ashford. Mm -hmm. One New Ashford. Mm -hmm. We have one student in the, uh, from New Ashford in that class, in that cohort. Right. This is just a choice conversation, so I'll leave it at that. I have some other questions about the class. That's a bunch. Do you have a question? Mm. Marty, your numbers are the same. Did you change them, or you're, you're coming forward with the same numbers you had last time? Because they're the same in this packet as they were in the last packet. No, we were going to change that given the uncertainty for uh, New Ashford. So, what would be so the current? There's differences? Yeah, like his first grade was four, and we talked about we not. We talked about not doing Yeah, that. and I. So I would, uh, we still want six, you know, at least mm -hmm. six choice slots. So I would say two uh, for next year's second grade. That would be 35 split into two sections. Um, so that'd be a class of 17 and a class of 18. I would say two in next year's fifth grade class. So four total? That would be 31 split in two classes, so a class of 15 and a class of 16. And I would recommend two in next year's sixth grade class, which would split. And that would be a total of 34 students, so you'd have two classes of 17. So none in first grade where you had four? Right. I'm sorry? So you had four in first grade. There are zero in first grade now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. Other comments, questions on this? So what, um, Joelle, were there any changes from you as far as what is printed here versus what? No. What you're at? Okay. Would our decision, excuse me, would our, would our decision on splitting that class affect your decision on how many choice students you want to recommend? In other words, if we split the class, would you want choice in that class? Yes. 
I don't know if the Can towers took question? split. That's what I was going to ask. We don't decide how many yeah. sections there are. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's we, true. We allocate funds, and he figures out how to spend them. But uh, I guess I'm, I'm contemplating, right? Can I? So we can, can I ask a question. Budget, however, right? right? Yeah. So I have a question so, yeah, for so Williams. Regina Tony. and then Dan. And then Do Dan. you make a practice of funding positions out of choice? No. At Great Lawton? Because you're looking at it opening the choice to fund the position, which is different than agreeing that there should be another position. That's a whole separate conversation. Yeah, no, I'm, so I'm, I'm more just thinking timing of our of decisions both by the administration and the school committee and are we doing this in the right order or are we gonna put you know, if we if either we or the town meeting adds to the budget, um, I think some we did that last year with the elementary school, added mm -hmm. to the budget with the purpose of funding another position. If that happens, I'm just, you know, and I hadn't really thought through it, does that affect Marty's choice recommendation to us with regard to that class? Um, so beyond that, I really wasn't, I wasn't getting too philosophical about those questions. So I've got it. I'm thinking about it. I've got a response to that in a second, but Dan, did did you want to respond first? Well, I guess oh, on that topic, or it's related, so I'm not sure. I'm I'm happy to defer, or um, I don't know. How about if I okay. I respond and then and then you either respond to or uh, as far as the order of decisions, the school choice opening of slots decision technically, I believe, should come before the budget decision because if we don't approve at least as many school choice slots as the budget needs or expects then the budget can't we might not want to move that same budget forward um, but again we can go back to the idea that we can always open up additional slots later um, the challenging thing would be if we open up slots and then we we then have regret later saying well but now we um, now we wish we could pull those back, but we've already let everybody know what we're committing to, um, which would be a, a little bit of a quandary. So it's easier to expand that than it is to contract it. Um, Dan? So I guess, I mean, part of what motivated my interest in the discussion about the, fir the initially proposed first grade choice slots was the possibility of pulling back the size of that first grade class to 24 or 25, not with the expectation that one would have fewer first grade classes, but that in future years in third grade or fourth grade, that you would have at least an opportunity with a 24 to 25 person class to consider offering only one section. Um, Based on the comments we've heard from the public, I guess I'm curious what the administration's response to those thoughts are. I know that at, um, in my experience at Williamstown, we've tended to not have a strict numerical standard, but rather to look at the actual individual students in each grade cohort with and to, to integrate a qualitative approach into whether it is educationally uh, advisable to make decisions about splitting or not. But I guess the, the reason I'm bringing this up here is that if I would have a different recommendation for choice if the administration told me that it's unlikely that we would ever want to ha to try to bring these two first grade sections into a single section in a future grade, I would perhaps make a different choice selection than if the administration told me, no, it's always going to be two sections. So it would be helpful for me to get guidance along those lines. So you want to know, what, like, the cohort that's traveling in the next year's first grade class, the current kindergartners? Right. And if that is a class that we would always have to keep two based on needs? I mean, like, so or, or an early uh, understanding the impossibility of, of being able to foresee that two or three years <coughs> out, out. But So if I it mean, remains at 29, you know, it would always be two classes. Yes. Um, at Lanesboro, we have... A, a half time reading specialist, we have a Title I math interventionist, we have special education staff <coughs> more than we've had um, 
you know, with the enrollment the way it is now. So would we look at how do we do master schedule at the school to make sure that everyone's needs are met and that class would stay too? Yeah, but I mean, it, they're, they're kindergartners. She's asking about the 24, would that ever be like in fifth grade, would that be one, one class if we didn't open the slots? So if you had 24 kids or 25 no kids oh, okay. in first grade. Um, I, I had it still at 29, so. Yeah, the, I remember this conversation. Right. So the 24 students, by the time they get up to fourth grade, could it be one class instead of two? Is the it is way too early to, to trend on what are kindergartners doing going into first grade. Like, I wouldn't know the need makeup. I mean. Yeah. So, so. Principal McAvoy's change in your changes to the proposals for choice are based merely on keeping the option open mm -hmm. based on further future assessment mm -hmm. with the acknowledgement that if we open up the choice slots and they're taken and we end up with a 28 to 29 that it there's always be there's split. it's always going to be correct. two sections okay I understand Al just this time, Chris and I have not discussed this prior to this meeting, but when I looked at the numbers last week, I had the concerns too about the 24 and fourth grade. And I, did, I and I'm like where Chris is right now, I'm not sure when we discussed that. I was going to ask Dr. McEvoy, uh, what are the options uh, for, for fourth grade? And I didn't, I, once again, I don't know when, when we're going to, when that uh, uh, discussion is appropriate. But I do have some concern because I know fourth grade, is is MCAS time, and I hate, and, you know, I hate to think that that we that we run our school system based on MCAS, but the reality is that we do give the MCAS tests in fourth grade. That's the reality, and it seems that uh, what are our options for fourth grade? Now, if you told me that there are no options, that we got to live with 24 students in fourth grade, uh, I can understand that. But that was a question I was going to ask. Yeah. Do we have, so that's why I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. Does school choice impact that option or does not impact that option? Well, the, they're, they're intimately related, but there's kind of one just by numbers necessity needs to come before the other. But I, I agree that you'd, you'd always want to flop back and forth. And I think that's what the administration and the schools do is they flop back and forth between the two things, looking at them, trying to figure out what to do. Um, one, before, before we have any replies to it, uh, I mean, Regina's right. The the lever that we have is is the budget. You know, it's it's the money allocated. Um, I I personally, I mean, it's one of our challenges at both schools, even more so at Lanesboro Elementary School, that when you have just one or two or maybe three sections of a of a grade, um, if we split twenty five into two. Not if we, but if the administration splits 25 into two, that's 12 and 13, which is which is a really small, uh, really small later grade. Um, but you know, so so then you, I think you ask, are, are there other solutions that can be out there that that help? Um, and it's not. I don't envy people trying to figure out: Do I go with 24 or do I go with two sections of 12? Um, it, it's not. I don't. I don't think there's a perfect solution because the the, the choices are are scary on both ends. I think. Um, are, those are, are those our two options? But the way the budget is, the bottom line, the way it is now, yes. I, I mean, I have nothing. I have no, nothing I could plug in there and make two two sections. So, and we'd have a class of thirteen and a class of twelve. Now, if we got five choice <coughs> students for fourth grade, then you'd have two classes of fifteen. But that's an unknown at this point. At the end, and the other math there is is that if you accept five new students into choice, that's you know, even if you're willing to fund teaching positions out of choice, that's twenty five thousand dollars that you've added, and in exchange, declaring that you have a new section is another bit of of tricky math because. A, a, a new teacher for that section is not twenty five thousand dollars. It's it's a whole lot more, and so you need to fund that as well. Um, and so that's part of the tussle that you know mentally we're we're in here. Uh, Carrie, 
Um, can I just ask, what are the supports other than the primary teacher? Because I imagine with 25 kids, you don't have just a teacher in the class. You have paras, you have There's other specialists. Full time. There's Title I math. Mm -hmm. There's reading support if the child needs it. And there's other specialist. related services, yeah. you know, based upon need. Mm -hmm. And there's special education based upon need. So, you know, the sheer class size is large, but the student to teacher ratio is probably much lower, or is much lower. Those are, so, those are the options, I, I guess I wanted to hear from you. I wanted to say, well, one of our options is to add a pair to the class, so we have two pairs instead of one. Or one of our options is to uh, push for, uh, you said there was one uh, a New Ashford student in fourth grade? There's one in the current yeah. third grade. Next well, week. Those are the options. Say, well, if we accept the tuition students from, from New Ashford, we could add, we can add pairs. I, I mean, those, uh, those are some of our options for going to prevent. The decision is to stay with 24, if that's the administrator's decision, <coughs> okay? And I don't want to do your job. Can we add another para? You know, based on the parameters of the budget. Again, that's 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 the way it is. It is what it is. I mean, it's, I can't. I can't unilaterally. <laughs> I, 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 I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Carrie. <laughs> I was just going to ask what Chris had a question too. I was just going to ask what the. I mean, it sounds like there is at times um, support in the town of Lanesboro to increase the budget in order to fund a teaching position. It doesn't mean that the town of Lanesboro can say use this money to fund a teaching position, but they would increase the budget with the understanding that that's the goal. So are we thinking that this is a case where this would garner support on the floor of town meeting, or is this very different from other times that that's happened? I don't know. I'm asking the question. It's a qualitative question. I don't know. I mean, it depends on the makeup of the town meeting probably that particular year, but yeah. it has in the past. and I Because it's a political decision when it yeah. comes down to it. I guess, Marty, is would that be, I, I asked last time we heard about the budget about, you know, your wish list if we, if we didn't maintain as what we are calling pretty much a level budget for the town of Lanesboro, you know, what would be the first things you address? Would that class size be at the top of the list, or do you have other pressing needs that a increased budget would, you know, uh, direct you toward? Well, I'm a firm believer that it's people, not programs, that make a great school. Um, and just to answer somebody's question before, the school council last year did ha did put forth a recommended class size um, guidelines, but of course it's non-binding. <laughs> but the the uh, the school council said K through two, 17 grades three and four, 20 to 21, grades five through six up to 24. So that's just food for thought. I mean, it's not binding, but that mm -hmm. is what, what the school council thought was reasonable. So what, uh, you know, the, the wish list question, what would you, you know, what do you, have you had the chance to think about what would be on that short list of things you'd do with an increase? This would be budget? up there. If, I mean, if there, if there was something that you said what would improve, you know, what would be good for the school, for sure. J just if in possible. the interest of the agenda, th th this is, budget. this impacts your, your choice thoughts, votes, or if, if it does, that's that's fair. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Okay. I, oh, no, I, I got off target onto the budget. It is no, tough to stay, stay between, but it you're is. right. I, have, uh, I do have, oh. Carrie? Yeah, so I, I would like to go to the comment about, you know, if Williamstown has this class size, Lanesboro should have this class size. And it was one of the things we talked about with regionalization, this question of equity. But then we had this decision to allocate, you know, the elementary schools would pay, I mean, the towns would pay for their elementary schools. And it sort of is in contradiction, right? So here we are facing the reality of we would like to be providing equity across towns, but we're also limited by what each town will support for its elementary school. So I think that should just be understood that we are dealing with this reality that we don't have full ability to have equity even if we wanted to because it's based on what the towns will support. On that subject, I would only add though that I think, you know, going forward with that understood, it's the school committee's mm -hmm. obligation to try to uh, 
try to do the right thing for those schools. You know, we can't assume that the town needs a zero budget. I mean, the 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 people at the select uh, select board office may tell us that's what they want, but we can't assume that's what the town wants who we work for. And I mean, so that's I'm struggling with that. Even though that is how we decided to finance this uh, regionalization, individual towns paying for the elementary school. As a school committee, that's tough to um, to practice. So I, I have some comments on this, but they're not related to choice. So I'm going to save them for the for the budget later. But Regina, I would like to suggest, with regard to choice and fourth, that since we can change that number at a later date, that at this point we not add anything to that grade. If we, as a committee, make the decision to increase the budget and try to get that money and then get it. That might be a, a different scenario, but if we add choice in there now and we can't get money to support a teacher, that's problematic. Just to so I, I think one of the things that's going to factor to that is the meeting that I have scheduled for tomorrow morning. And so, but we have to vote a budget tonight with an outlier dollar amount of tuition. And so, with m having an affirmative there would make a lot easier this discussion. So. So what we have before us right now, just to make sure that, that I'm clear and we're clear, for Leansboro Elementary School, the proposal is that we, uh, rather than looking at the yellow column in the sheets that you have in your packet, the proposal is to open up two new slots in second grade, two new slots in fifth grade, two new slots in sixth grade, and at Williamstown Elementary School to open up four slots in kindergarten three slots in grade one, two slots in grade four, and three slots in grade six. Is that, so when it, first I want to make sure that I'm correct in restating that. And then I want to see, does anybody have any more discussion that they want to have before we request a motion from someone? So it's the same number, just reallocated. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. That's the best I could say. You want a motion? Uh, yes, I would love a motion. Would you like? I'll move to accept the um, choice um, <coughs> slots as recommended by the principals. Is, all right, Chris seconded. Um, discussion on this. Can I ask that the revised choice sheet be, or this yep. the sheet as revised yep. be sent to us yes. separately? Thanks. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. All right, next up, FY19 budget. Um, it's going to be Groundhog Day on the discussion probably, but discussion regarding public hearing. Uh, Open it up to the committee here. Um, Regina? Yeah. I think we kind of have had the discussion that was generated from the public hearing regarding whether or not we want to increase the length of our budget to allow for a teacher. That's my input. That's what I've heard. Dan? Run that pitch again, Jane. I said the conversation we had I think already reflected on what we heard at the public hearing around whether or not we wanted to vote to increase the Lanesboro request to support a teacher. Dan? I have a question about the capital budget. I'm a little bit confused about the order of events. I had thought that when when Mark Sheik was here last time with the building project. I had gotten the sense that we'd already borrowed what we're going to borrow, but yeah. tonight we talked about yes. another bond coming out. So yeah, if if somebody can mm -hmm. fill me in, that'd be great. Actually, Steve could probably do it, but it's a cleanup sure. bond. It's okay. basically so we have expenses that we will incur before the final MSBA reimbursement. 
Because it can take up to what a, two and years. Clark or said two years. Two today. years before the MSBA will determine exactly what it. It doesn't ever reimburse 100 percent of what it says it will. Right. It's usually 95, 96, 97. <clears throat> hopefully 97, 98. You know, it's somewhere in there, but they don't. So we have expenses in between that time, and so it's a short-term borrowing, just okay. a, a cleanup. Okay. So. We've already locked. We already have the big borrowing. Yes, it's locked in. Mm -hmm. It's done. Yes, um, but we're just doing the small borrowing now. It's therefore still important to maintain the bond rating and mm -hmm. and our creditworthiness. That justifies the discussion that we had about uh, E and D. Correct. Um, and okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, so. So is that why the capital, exp the capital budget, will grow incrementally by that hundred and sixty-ish thousand dollars? No. So we have two I more heights. Oh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to say something that hopefully someone can expand. Did we agree to step it in over two years? And I think this is now year two. So we had discussions as to whether or not we wanted to ramp it up immediately or if we wanted to break it up into two years, increase a bit in year one, and then increase to the final level in year two to minimize the effects to the town. And then it will be even. And then it will be even from that point on. Okay, but it was but it was mostly done in year one, and that's why the increase is only in mm -hmm. like the 10% range? Right. Okay, yeah. all right. But, but we didn't do 100% in year one just so that the towns okay. would have time to adjust. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Yep. Yep. <coughs> other, other things on this uh, on the uh, around the public hearing. I just want to say I think they did a really nice job with explaining how this transitioned and what was going on. Thank you. I'm not going to take all the credit. I'll take most of it. <laughs> 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 it was a team effort. Uh, so can we just review the if this then that and then because there were a couple of moving pieces yes here. so there was changes from what we presented the other night so um, we have it narrowed down of what we're we'll be asking for for uh, choice in indiana in the budgets but there were also some sequential things that have been talked about like if if we vote choice, then this, and if the tuition agreement comes through, then that, and so I just just like to get a sense. Yep. And you, we talked about yep. maybe revoting the budget based on the tuition, and maybe you know. So I think it's it would just be good to kind of get that down in order. So here, um, so when we looked at numbers, I don't know at the last meeting, we had looked at allocating some money out of the Williamson Elementary School choice. And then we looked at allocating some money out of the Lanesboro Elementary School choice. Um, and those were based on what we needed to try to keep our percentages going back to the two towns. Um, is, is, and go ahead. It just uh, this is page nine within the, the finance portion of the, oh. of the packet here, so that everybody, just in case you can't read the, oh. the numbers <laughs> up on the screen. So when we were here, so the, the amount of um, choice money that we need to bring the Williamstown down to below 2% mm -hmm. is 163094 dollars For the Lanesboro budget, we had, um, we'll be looking to take 155813 from choice. And then at Mount Greylock, we did not allocate choice in E&D at, at the time, the level of it in which until we went back to the drawing board to take a look at what the assessments going back to the town were because we have the wiggle room of E and D to help reduce the assessments back to the town. Mm -hmm. Looking at the E and D amount and knowing that we have choice revenues that we've always built into our budgets, mm -hmm. um, we're comfortable, you know, making the recommendation of school choice of three hundred and forty thousand dollars and E and D of two hundred and forty thousand dollars. So those were the outliers from last week. So this is accounting for all revenues that we're aware of that are actuals. Um, and our outliers are, you know, again, the re reimbur tra regional transportation reimbursement, 
some flex on circuit breaker. Um, we've increased the use of circuit breaker because we had some rollover funds that so we'll be, you know, utilizing that to offset the cost of out of district placements. So, you know, some of the other caveats for what, what we're seeing this year to what we'll see next year is um, Chapter 71 and charter tuition because those are reimbursements for um, related to the year prior. Our charter, or both of those, don't increase. Uh, from in absolute terms from the state they don't significantly increase from this year to next year because the FY19 chapter 71 transportation aid will be based on costs incurred in FY18 right. um, whereas for FY20 we'll actually see that jump up mm -hmm. a pretty significant amount because the two elementary schools um, will will contribute to what is reimbursed um, we, we do have we do have our hope that we might get some of FY18 reimbursed in FY19 um, but that's not we, we don't have any numbers from the right. state we have no assurances we just have hope hmm. um, and yeah so we're not budgeting on hope here we're but <coughs> Dan what's the what's the district's historical philosophy been with respect to e and I mean you know, I know, Carrie, you mentioned there being some pressure at times to bring it down, I think, the E&D balance. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know that in the past we had much larger school choice balances at WES, mm -hmm. and there was pressure to bring those down as well. Um, so I I just, what's, what's you know, is, is a lot of E and D good? Is it bad? Is well, you it only neither? Can have, What's yeah. the? You can only have five percent. Understood. You know, so right now our five percent is lower because it's based on just the um, amount for Mount Greylock. Right. So our our number would you know doesn't even pike above. It doesn't peak above six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So when you're getting close to that and you feel like you you know in the eight years that I've been here we've reduced E and D to reduce the assessments back to the town, but still always keeping some level of health in the E and D because that's that's our only reserve. We don't have free cash like the towns do. So right. um, so it's we have to keep some level of it's like an insurance plan in, in that fund. So because yeah. we can't go to the towns if I mean we would have to have a town meeting Correct. or something. You know, we, yeah. we don't have the ability if the roof caves in, sorry. Right. <laughs> to, <laughs> um, but Andy, what did you call it? The towns have not free cash. Stabilization. 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 So it's essentially our stabilization fund and um, the political back and forth is that the towns sometimes want us to use more E and D. And we sometimes suggest to the towns, well, you could use stabilization money in order to pay for that truck. And it's just this kind right. of, um, you know, there's no right and there's no wrong. But in the last several years, we've kept the E&D as high as we can and for the bond rating. There have been times when we've gotten too close to that limit. Okay. And almost, you can't go over it or you basically get back to the town. Yeah. Right. You're assessed back to the town. Yeah. Okay. Which isn't the end of the world, but right. for, for, for credit purposes, like right now, we, we want to be as close to that cap as we, right. as we can. Also, to give you an idea, uh, E&D at 2016 was 688,450. We're down to how up to the 566, 502, and then with projections for what will be closed out this year, if all things go according to plan, we'll be at that 440 number. Mm -hmm. and so so it it's we're right. down, but it is one of those things where, <clears throat> excuse me, again, if you look at the trends of free cash and stabilization in cities and towns, you'll see that roller coaster of, you know, they'll have good years, they'll be able to put things back in, and then they'll use it for different varying sources. So it is very much a a uh, parabolic trend as long as it comes back up then yes. right. yeah mm -hmm. exactly it's fine. Um, yeah, well, and yeah go ahead. no go ahead because uh, i have a slightly different topic and, and so th that's also part of what just across the board we're we're constantly mindful of is that if if we're using a significant amount of choice at, at any of the schools that's potentially especially if it's an excess of revenue <laughs> that's bringing that fund down and then the question is, and we dealt with it at West over the last few years, um, if you keep on spending it down and if you're using the choice to help offset growth in your budget, then at some point you hit a wall 
because right. the towns aren't going to be expecting a jump in the appropriated um, to compensate for what you can no longer spend in choice. But then you also can't just all of a sudden be increasing your, your choice. You, know, you, you can't all of a sudden jump up in terms of your, of your revenue. So it's a very slippery slope that that, you know, that that set of lines within the budget, once you've kind of started milking that and using it, it's difficult to get off of it without either requesting a big increase or making big cuts within some area of your school that you really don't want to. Uh, yeah, so it's... Speaking of which, what is the balance in choice? Oh, it's, oh that packet. was the paper yeah. that went around? Oh. That was okay. the one where, where we got the updated sheet right before. So each school has its own, that's okay, its own choice amounts. Um, I don't have a copy of it here with me, so... <laughs> This thing about about E and D and, and it came up uh, at, at the meeting that, that in the at uh, Lanesboro with the uh, uh, select board. I don't think you should compare E and D with stabilization. I I, I, I think it confuses people when you do that. Towns have a lot of ways to get extra money. Stabilization, they have overlay, they have overlay surplus, they have a lot of ways to get money. And so when you say that, well, e and is like stabilization, it isn't like stabilization. It, 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 it's something that we have in, in reserve. So people say, well, if the people look at the E&D and say, well, what you're really doing is hiding money. Well, we're not hiding money. We're putting a reserve in there because we don't have the option to, if we had a storm and 20 windows are broken in, 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 in this building, we, we, have to use e, we have to use our E and D to, to get those 20 will, uh, windows fixed. We can't go to Lanesboro and Williamstown and say, hey, we, we each got, you each got to give us $5,000 to fix the windows. So, so that's a lot different than if you have a stabilization fund and you have 10 windows broken at Lanesboro Elementary School, but let's go to the reserve fund and just make a reserve fund transfer of $15,000. So I think you confuse, I, I don't knock the public, but you confuse the public when you just say stabilization and uh, uh, E&D. And that's why it comes up at meetings with select boards when they say that, and then we have to explain to the select board the difference between stabilization and E&D. E&D is critical for the workings the smart workings of a school. And, and I agree with you 100%, we should be at the 5% gap. And we have had historical instances when we have gone above the 5% gap when monies have been returned to the, ver to the, to the various towns. So I, I think the e and is, is a non-starting, uh, in my opinion, a non-starting question. I think we should have e and in, and I think you should go right to 4.9999999%. That's my opinion. Financially, because um, we're talking about E and D, and I think probably there are a lot of folks who don't really haven't had um, experience with it and excess and deficiency. Right? There is a way. I mean, we have to budget it a year in advance. Mm -hmm. But was, what Al was saying and what I was saying about the roof, there is emergency use, mm -hmm. right, of E and D. That's the only way we can justify taking E and D out in that given year. And that's where it is different from stabilization, which I assume they can do a transfer in a given year. We can't transfer out of E and D in the current fiscal year unless it's an emergency. Is that Actually, right? Or first of all, about stabilization, you would have to go back to the appropriating authority and get a, any use of stabilization requires two-thirds two sure. vote of okay. the appropriate authority. So you would have to have a special town meeting to then uh, use stabilization funds, or even at your annual town meeting if there's a use of stabilization. Mm -hmm. e and D, you can use the e and D as you say, for the emergency situation. And also, though, if you decide to use it for some other reason, stuff, you do have to go back and tell, we learned this at our training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and tell the town officials and uh, either they have an X number of days to respond back to the school committee. If they say yes, go ahead, because it's not going to impact their assessments or no, don't. As soon as they say no, it's a non-starter. But mm -hmm. you can, if you decide to use E&D and communicate to the town saying that we'd like to use X amount of dollars of E&D, it's going to have no impact on the assessment. I believe it's 10 days or it might be even a little longer, something that they have to respond back to you saying 
no or yes. Why would they ever say no? Well, you never know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, so if you go back just, to the town and you, say, <laughs> and you say, listen, we're going to use that E and D, and they're going to say, where does it impact us? And you say, no, okay. <laughs> so, so, so saying that, that, the, that the town impacts E and D is not quite, quite correct. E and D is it, it's it's like a, having a savings account that everyone should have. Every, if you if you have a home, I don't, I don't want to get into a lecture about how you should reserve your money, but we need a reserve of, uh, of account to take care of, of things that happen in the region. And I respectfully disagree about stabilization because towns have many ways to find money. I don't want to go through them all with the, again with the overlay and over, but we have towns have ways to do that. E and D is critical to the to the to the. Uh, to the region, and we should. I think we should have it, and we should have it at point. But I don't want to treat myself. With and and we are trying to I keep think it that's what we're yeah. articulating tonight. So I mean, that's our goal, Al. We're not, you know, we know not to drive it over five. Right. We know to carry a healthy amount, you know, because we need it. But we also have to use it annually to, you know, bring it down and also offset the assessments right. to the town. So and we're we using it appropriately in the budget. Yep. We're thorough about it. And <coughs> we're thoughtful about yep. it, and I agree with that too. And Joe, yeah. just to follow up a little bit on Al's, and not for this budget, but for future years, I'd, I'd recommend at least looking into if there are vehicles that we can use to set a money aside for long-term liabilities that the district may mm -hmm. incur. We might want to consider starting to create reserves for that because um, the pay-as-you-go strategy that uh, that we've used up until now in some cases leads to it can lead to kind of dramatic bursts of spending for which it would be nice to have that kind of reserve set up to be fiscally prudent i just don't know legally what what our opportunities are for that i know the towns have some capability of doing it i don't know whether districts have the same capability or not but again for a few your discussion I, I think we've tried a couple of times and Lanesboro hasn't approved it okay um, so you do have to have town approval and yeah. I think that was a case so where they said we'd rather you come back to us than, okay. than put money aside but it's certainly worth looking at again but okay. it, yeah it, it can be a subject for a yeah. meeting out of budget cycle it, it, it is something that we've I know that at the finance subcommittee level we've been evaluating what revolvers are options at the regional school district level but uh, yeah, but that will be for a time soon near us. Uh, Would you like a motion to accept the budget? So, yeah, I'm, before we even do the motion, I think that there are some things that are still pending. Like, we are still figuring out tuition arrangements. Yep. We do still reserve the right to um, do something related to school choice slots. Correct. We also, like, Along with that, we can reserve the right to end up decreasing our assessments to the two towns. Um, so those are the levers that we've got here. And I think that, you know, th this budget's here, mm -hmm. it's approvable, but it, it, it's not going away. Um, so I, you know, the conversations will continue. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, I think that the we need to do a two-part dance. The first is to um, vote the net, budgets, the net budget subject to appropriation. And then the second part would be to vote the budget as a as a whole. So all of the all of the information that goes into it. Uh, Andy, would you mind um, letting us know the motion that you would recommend for that net budget subject to appropriation, just from the. So the I guess uh, there yeah okay so I would move uh, to approve a net operating budget subject to appropriation of fifteen million six hundred forty thousand one hundred forty four dollars so for the committee before somebody on the committee actually moves that motion that's on page nine of what you received tonight um, within the red folder as you were coming in um, that is in cell e23 and that represents the total um, sorry, uh, Andy, that's the, that's operating only? That is operating only, because I, you, I guess I usually have them vote operating and debt separately. 
Okay. Why so. are we making two votes? Remember last year we had to come back and vote yeah. two numbers? No. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I remember <laughs> hearing about that even yeah. though I wasn't here. Dick had to uh, split the numbers because of the debt, something to do okay. with, yeah. So, and, and that's part of why I was, I was stumbling a little bit, making sure that Andy and Andy was going to lead the way here. So th that's the net operating assessment to the member town. So that's Correct. not split apportioned to the two separate towns, but that is the net operating assessment that somehow is split to go back to the two towns. Um, so would somebody like to move the motion to accept a net operating assessment to member towns subject to appropriation of 15 million six hundred and forty thousand a hundred and forty four dollars so moved is there a second on that a second <laughs> <laughs> i was scared there for a second <laughs> uh discussion on that just one quick question uh the finance subcommittee considered this budget yes does the finance subcommittee have a formal recommendation of the budget To approve it we did we, we, we did not vote to recommend <laughs> okay. this to the full committee because the numbers were constantly changing yes we right right okay. I can't really say that. you want yeah. us to vote so, so, so i'd say that, that that the members of the finance subcommittee have certainly had this latest version but this latest version is changed since our last finance subcommittee understood um, yeah. but yeah. that would carry some weight but not <laughs> you know but no but it's right. an understandable thing given the, the timing of the process. It's a special year. Uh, so where does this budget put us in terms of the question we've discussed about additional teaching staff and all that? What are, where do we stand with that if we vote this budget? Uh, so we, I mean, I'm meeting with New Asher tomorrow mm -hmm. with Chris and Joe teleconference or phone conferencing in. And then we'll be asked, I'm going to, before we leave here this evening, try to get another meeting set with this committee to um, hear what, the, what they brought back to us to, to, you know, see if we can have a, a tuition agreement with them. If that agreement comes through, then, you know, a portion of that money can be used to, you know, if, that, if the decision is that mm -hmm. it's in the best interest of the school and the kids to split the cop class, then we could, you know, consider using that tuition revenue. But based on the budget that we have in front of us and the revenues that we have available, um, there's I would have to make cuts someplace else at Lanesboro in order to mm -hmm. to do to split the class because choice wouldn't bring in the revenues. I would need ten plus choice students to mm -hmm. pay for the to offset the cost of the teacher. So mm -hmm. I, I know we're voting a budget tonight. I also know at the regional level we've revoted numbers um, as long as the number's going down. So mm -hmm. uh, So <clears throat> to me philosophically using tuition to pay for a teaching position is the same as using choice, choice. to pay for yep. a teaching position which goes back to what joe says mm -hmm. when you hit the wall then you have to cut a position I, I would rather make the decision of we add money and advocate for a position or we don't add money and yep. advocate for a position that so. is part of an appro uh, appropriated budget mm -hmm. that stays with marty next year when he has to figure out what to do in the year after that and the year after that yeah. chris i guess you know I think we do need to, and, and we are coming to some conclusion and finality on this discussion about that Lanesboro Elementary School budget. Um, I guess, you know, if you look at a teacher costing 100000 a new teacher, which probably is over their salary and fringe benefits, that's 3.5% mm -hmm. of $2.8 million or 2.7% of $3.6 million. So it's a significant impact on the Lanesboro budget. And for me, it's a really hard call, 25 or Two, two, a 12 and a 13. That's a very difficult decision. And you know, at the end of the day, I think for me, it's I, I leave it to the administrator to make that hard decision and make the recommendation to us, which he has. Um, you know, I would say for future reference uh, to the Lanesboro Elementary School that you know we've had this change, and for years you're talking to the Lanesboro Elementary School and to the town, and now we we're a region, and you're. You know, you're talking to a different audience and and um, you know we can't 
if I understand it correctly, we can't go above this budget now that Correct. if we vote it tonight. Um, we could go down from it, but we can't ask for a higher budget. Now the town might, but we can't. Is Correct. School, is that the right? town can add money to the school budget from the floor like they did for the kindergarten class last year. They can increase it yeah. for the elementary school, but we can't increase it. So personally, I, I would favor as a philosophy going in at a 2.5% or 1.5% increase rather than a flat. And then, you know, you, you can come backward. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I, I rely on our administrators to make that hard decision. I'm not, not going to try to overrule it. Yeah. The other thing, just not being an educator uh, at both of our elementary schools, as well as at our middle and high school to a, to a lesser extent, I, it, it, uh, it creates the big swings to go from 25 down to, down to 13. Um, and that's challenging. It's challenging fiscally. Um, it, it might be great educationally, but it's very challenging fiscally. And so I, I do wonder whether we can all work together to try to find ways to help grapple with that. I, you know, I, I think that people often say, well, you know, it, it's not the same to put another paraprofessional into the classroom. It's not the same to have more support um, aligned with the classroom and reading and math and other things. But um, it, it, the issue is not going to go away at either elementary school. Uh, given that both of them are, are small enough that, you know, at, at, a, at a massive elementary school in a city, you know, where you're all in one building, then your, your shifts when you have 20 more kids in a grade versus the prior year, you, you've got, you know, you, if you do create another section, it doesn't end up having a massive impact, whereas this, this is, and I sympathize with both sides. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not an educator, and I do feel like we need to both pity and trust our our teams in the building. So, so right now, Marty has full time some full time and even part time <coughs> specialists that we're maintaining at full time and part time statuses, and it, within their schedules, they have intervention blocks. So they're licensed teachers that are going into into the classroom, and I, you know, without any reduction to the specialist <coughs> schedules, then in the class your enrollment is low as it is, then the expectation is, is that they would be doing the same type of targeted intervention next year. Mm -hmm. So we know that we have music, art, gym, computer, like they're all in doing targeted intervention on top of a full-time speech and language pathologist, a point six occupational therapist, a point five reading, and 15 hours a week of Title I. So with the amount of relate supports and interventions in there, could we successfully schedule fourth grade is, is the question. I won't say it's ideal. I'm not asking um, that. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. But I mean, again, it, within the parameters of the budget that I was asked to come in at, that's what, you know, without massive cuts somewhere else, that's what it looks like. It, that's what it is. The, the other thing, just to foreshadow a conversation that might happen in the coming weeks, currently if we're spending one hundred and fifty-five thousand out of choice. Uh, that that is decreasing our balance from the start of the year to the end of the year. So we're going to be bringing in less money than we will be spending um, within that account. So that you know, it, it, if we did have revenue come in in the form of tuition, it, it, it would all, like it wouldn't just be new money it would be new money with the caveat of we we were bringing down that choice balance pretty pretty significantly year over year with this budget and how do we factor that into and how do we ask the administration to factor that into plans for next year as well because um, that's kind of that's the that's the related question is, is if we're going to start start the year with $178,000 in, in choice and end the year with $109,000 in choice, that means that next year for FY20, we can't allocate it. And, and that mm -hmm. again, that, that is, we've seen that at Williamstown mm -hmm. Elementary School right. too, that it, it can't, we're going to need to figure out what to do to, to carve out, a, or get out of that hole a little bit. Um, so that's just another thing, just to, it, it's mm -hmm. a damper on the conversation, but it's, it's something to be thinking about because um, it's also something that we've we've done at Burlington Elementary, and, and we continue to kind of slowly climb out of that hole now by doing things. But 
um, we're going to need to figure it out at all of our schools. Uh, related to that, yep. how, how many years in a row have we come in essentially flat at Lanesboro Elementary? Mm -hmm. Three. This is the this, this is the fourth. But the what we've done is draw down choice reserve in order to come in flat. It's and the so fourth. One was a mat, one was a big cut of 160 grand before I came. And then it was three after that. Right. So we've been drawing down choice essentially, mm -hmm. like what happened at Williamstown, and sooner or later we're going to hit that wall. And so uh, you know, there's. So mm -hmm. that begs the question. I didn't really want to talk anymore about this, but why? Why? Why four years in a row? Why? Why are we uh, coming in flat? Is it? We have, I mean, they're, they're going to, from the town's perspective, they're going to say we have declining enrollment. So the staffing we have now is what we had, or pretty close to what we had when there was 315 students. So we haven't lost instructional staff. So We've that's lost the paraprofessionals. Yeah. Like we had some major cuts to special education. So that's the comeback that we need to prepare answers for. Uh, if enrollment's declining, oh yeah, th that means w w that means the question is why aren't you coming in with a with a lower budget related to that? Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and, and well, the complexity is the regional. We know the answers to those questions. Those aren't those, well, those, those aren't new questions and, and, and answers. Mm -hmm. uh, can we can we speak to that? Sure. I. I when we did that thing about the four four years when that was brought up, and, and uh, I kind of bit, bit my tongue on this and said, well, it's a new region. I, I talked to Dr. McAvoy, and we, and we felt that, okay, we, we, can, we can make it with this year. But uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to, uh, to drawing the line of sand and saying, hey, guys, uh, hey, people, uh, this is what we need to have a level one school in Lanesboro, and that... Uh, uh, you got to start get, getting more revenue if that's the issue. And however you do it, either put in solar panels or whatever you got to do. But, uh, but we're not going to go f an another year uh, with, with flat education for Lanesboro as a level one school. And that's the bottom line. So I'm really biting my tongue this year in, in, in doing that. But I think that I personally think that that's that's what we should be doing, mm -hmm. and we should. When we have an, I think we have an obligation. Lanesboro is an educational town. That's the bottom line. I've been in the town for almost over 25 years, and I've been in education for almost 35 years. And if you ask a hundred educators, what's what's the best education? What's the best elementary school in, in the, the county? They're going to list Lanesboro. If you ask a a hundred people in in the county. What do they think about Lanes Lanesboro Elementary School? They're going to say one of the best in the county. And I think that that we should lay down the line and say that we're going to start producing and not be in a situation that Dr. Beckmore says to me, he says, that's the limit of the budget, so that's the way it is. We're going to start saying this is what we need to run a level one school. So, and, and the other direct, just because I posed the question, the other direct answer to my question is if you had a $100,000 budget related to 100 kids, and if you all of a sudden drop down to 80 kids, in no way, shape, or form does that mean that you only need $80,000 to accomplish the same job. Um, there are plenty of fixed costs related to operating a school. There are plenty of things that, that are amortized across all of the students in the school. And so we need to, uh, I think part of our job here over the next couple of years is to be able to demonstrate, he, here's where those costs are fixed, here's, bless you, here's where they're variable, and, and here's, Here's how and why we justify what we're what we're asking for, because um, I think it'll only strengthen all of the school's positions if we if we continue to do that and, and really ramp that up, that analysis and that justification. All right. Any so we we, we have a motion that has been moved and seconded. I, is there any other discussion on that? Do we roll call vote this? We do, I believe. R roll call vote. Should we just? Terranova, aye. Dota, guy. Aye. Bergeron, aye. Green, aye. Green, aye. Kaplinger, aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, now we need a motion on the capital. 
Would somebody like to, and Andy, jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but would somebody like to move a motion um, to accept a gross capital budget and therefore assessment of one million nine hundred and fifty seven thousand three hundred and twenty five dollars. I would like to so move. Second. Should I have that be a part of the same motion? Yeah. You need the total number. Well, I, I was actually planning on that being a third motion, but yeah. but, but if I can have do a, I would do a third. You, you would do a third. Yeah. I, okay. You've got um, all bases covered. So moved by Miller, seconded by Kaplinger. Uh, any discussion on that? Roll call vote. Starting over with Al. Sorry, no, bye. Dodi Dodi aye. Bergeron, aye. Dodi aye. Green, aye. Kaplinger, aye. Motion passes unanimously. And therefore, we have a, uh, would somebody like to move a motion to accept a net budget subject to appropriation of operating and capital combined of is that the nineteen seven nine four seven two six? Um it's it's fifteen six forty okay. plus the right so it's seventeen five nine seven four six nine. Seventeen five nine seven four six nine. Four six nine, yes. Searching for that. That's just uh, a combo uh, addition of the two correct. other. Yep, that's just straight addition. Okay. Okay. So move that. Is there a second? No second. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Karen Oba aye. Dodi guy. Aye. Bergeron aye. <coughs> Green aye. Kaplinger aye. Motion passes unanimously. So those are the legally required ones. Um, we have often voted to accept the budget as presented, you know, so in terms of the content of the budget with the breakdown of how it will be spent, and that uh, is, I think, a valid and worthwhile thing to do. Uh, would somebody like to move a motion to accept the budget as it was presented um, in its entirety in the packet? that we had before us tonight in the red folder. So moved. I'll second. So is there a dollar figure associated with that? That, that would more be the, the breakdown in terms of the function codes. The, it, it, it's more raising the ability to then have a committee member say, actually, I thought that we were going to be spending X out of the 2000s, Y out of the 4000s, and so on. OK. So I mean, I guess the the question I have is, we voted on an appropriated budget. The appropriated budget is locked for those purposes. Mm -hmm. If we vote the budget as presented, is the entire budget locked? Or can we make future decisions about, you know, I mean, with these, with these variable sources of money that may or may not come in, they won't affect the appropriated budget, but they might affect the non-appropriated part, and so I'm just making sure we're not cornering ourselves by I, by locking something in. You're not cornering yourself. You okay. have that ability as long as within the assessment number, that back to the thing of you can't raise it, you can only lower it. So if indeed after the discussions occur, then honestly, if you go back to your the school committee policy on budget transfers, you have that authority to transfer budgets even, you know, because I, I recommend it's sort of my practice with uh, the clients we work with is that, you know, after all the town meeting and the dust is settled, it sounds like a somewhat tongue in cheek comment, but we're going to rebuild this budget from scratch anyways when we start to know grant information, more information on revolving account, things that occur over the summer. So you're not locked in at all by voting that dollar. Okay. And I guess that would be my concern is that it's not a it, this is not a permanent line item structure, so I don't feel the need to vote the line items that we've been presented tonight. We're going to have to do line item transfers if we move money. We're going to have to vote line item transfers if we're moving between categories. The whole committee has to vote that. So, I mean, I'm happy to do it, but I think we all just need to understand that this is a fluid 
budget not on the bottom line, but on where the money is going to sit. The, the, the thing is, if we don't vote any numbers aside from the aside from the top level numbers, uh, then we haven't really voted how much money we're spending within the 2000 area of a versus the, the 6,000 area, because that, that money could be moved fluidly by somebody without anybody really being able to say, hey, I, that's not what I intended by See, that's what I vote. When I vote a budget, I'm voting all the lines that we, so I don't feel the so need to. So that's what we're doing, but, but that's what this motion Isn't that what we did before, though? So no, we, we, we just voted the numbers. Yeah. This just makes it more explicit. We <laughs> voted to have just a, a big number that we wanted to assess back okay. to the back gotcha. to the towns. One for operating, one for capital, and then one that represents the sum of those two. But but this is voting the the, the details of it. Gotcha. All right. Plus the additional money that isn't in the other part. I mean, it's not just the details of the number we just mm -hmm. appropriated. It's the it's the entire amount. It does mean that 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 if somehow no grant money shows up or no tuition money shows up, it it, it means that that we need to make some decisions as yep. a as a committee. Which I think is actually a good thing. Agreed. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Are you looking for a motion? Uh, it, was it, it was moved and seconded. You seconded. Yeah. <laughs> Strong <Starting Yeah>. motion. <laughs> and then that was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Come on. laughs> All right. Uh, and this, I think, t technically, we don't need to roll call about it, but I think we sh we should just as a practice. So. Terrence, over here. Dota guy. Bill I. Bergeron I. Delego I. Green I. Kaplan or I. Next time we'll go. Yeah. We'll go <laughs> the <laughs> other <laughs> way. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, motion passes delayed. unanimously. All right. Um, we do not right now need to vote to create any additional revolvers. We'd we'd been considering the the prospect of it, but at this point, it's not something that's been uh, recommended to us. So. We are off the hook for that. Um, we are not prepared tonight to um, to handle item six, discussion regarding staff requests for leave of absence, which moves us straight <coughs> to the superintendent search next steps with the update from the search committee. Um, with the possibility of voting depending upon the information that um, is presented. Yeah, so I will be brief as it is tough for me to talk tonight. So the search committee has recommended two strong candidates to be advanced to the transition committee. I have contacted both of them and both of them have confirmed that they want their names advanced. They are Kim Grady, the interim superintendent at Mount Greylock, and John Vosberg, the principal at Taconic High School in Pittsfield. Given the situation of where our district is today, I have contacted Dorothy Presser, who has been helping us with the search committee from the MASC as to what the options of this committee are. And she has said that we have the ability to decide as a transition committee to do interviews and site visits of the two candidates, to just do interviews of the two candidates, or to make a decision tonight based on the information we have available. And I wanted to just make sure that the committee knew that these are the options we have available. So that, that's right. news to me. So we don't have to go through an interview process. We can just vote without taking that formal step. Correct. Oh. So you know, given, given that this was an expedited search and given the discussions in the search committee and the transition committee, I thought it would be useful for the transition committee to know all possible options available. Does the search committee have a recommendation on, the, on how to proceed on those three options? The search committee has not discussed those three options. Dan, being on the search committee, do, do you have anything else that you want to add there? I think Steve sums it up pretty fairly. Um, for my part, and speaking just for me, but I think that hmm. No, I think I think what Steve said is 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 reason enough. I think that's I think that's adequate for these purposes. We didn't we didn't discuss that possibility. I think that I think that what we had thought at the search committee level was that the transition committee would would want to do a 
would want to do its own process with respect to the candidates um, and that the vote of the committee to leave that to the search committee speaks for itself. Wait to leave it to the search committee or the transition committee? What the leaving it to the transition committee. Okay. Mm -hmm. I Regina? I would note it would have been helpful to note those options okay. when we received this packet so we had a better opportunity to have reviewed the information that was forwarded us to by the search committee to make the informed decision they're asking us to make at this point. I'm, I'm yeah. looking through it now. But. Mm -hmm. I want to interview the candidates. I, I didn't, what, we didn't go through all this now just to have a vote. I want to be. I want to ask them questions. And, and it's also an option to, to, to wait to do some kind of a vote on this until a later yes. meeting if people if people feel as though they they are they're not prepared to, to really weigh in on the discussion definitively. I, I think the option that's that that exists is, is there so that after people review the the material um, that came in over the weekend that um, y y you do have a question before you of is it is it best to go through the full interview and site visit process or is it best to um, to evaluate based on the material that was there and make a decision you know that that um, legally that's the that's a set of options that um, MASC provided to us as far as uh, what within their technical advisory role is is reasonable if we I want more sorry if we want more time when would we make that decision of how to proceed i thought we were doing that tonight but we didn't have the well we, we, we can, can make that decision tonight yep we, we can make the decision tonight or we can um if, if i think that if even a, a significant subset of us um says that they'd like more time then it behooves us to to wait and and put it on an agenda uh, our, our next meeting right now is scheduled for the 27th um so that's just a week from now uh, yeah, no, uh, Go ahead. I'll say this I was perhaps the most vocal opponent of doing the process and, and was supporting supportive of the idea of disappointing Ms. Grady but now at this point I, I think um, we owe both candidates an interview especially since we've, we've released the names and um, that we ought to just follow through and complete the process um, you know, I, if people want more time, I'd certainly be willing to reconsider that, but I think that's probably the right thing to do and just get on with it and move on to interviews. It's nice to hear they're both local candidates, so it'll be a little easier for them and for us, and and um, that's, my, that's my impression tonight. I guess, I mean, my feeling is that this committee requested the process, so I would therefore be surprised if they didn't want the process to continue with at least an interview. I think we can make a decision about a site visit or not a site visit later, but um, it, it seems consistent with the vote of the majority that we move forward with at least an interview, in my opinion. All right. <coughs> did, did somebody have a motion that they would, that they would like to move? I move that we, inter that we interviewed candidates. I is there a second for that? I will second. Discussion on. So uh, I, will, yeah. I will say I think Chris and I have somewhat switched positions <laughs> to <laughs> maintain <coughs> uh, conservation of uh, views. I, th I think both candidates are strong. I'm, you know, very interested in both of them. Uh, given the current situation of what our district is and what our district needs, I understand both options. And that's why, you know, I'm torn, and I think a lot of people in the search committee were torn. We're torn between? Uh, in, in terms of, you know, what would be best to recommend. I would just say that, you know, when we did, I'm, I'm in the middle here because even though I did advocate for the process, um, clearly the 
search has yielded fewer candidates than we thought it might and not necessarily candidates with the experience that we thought it might. So I do think, you know, the way Steve phrase, framed it is that we have the candidate material and if we have strong feelings that that it's not necessarily true that both candidates are coming at this with the level of experience that we need or with the breadth of experience, then it may just, this may be the end of the process. So I think that's the point, Al, is that we voted on the process. I very strongly advocated for the process. Um, but now we see where the process has led and what the process has yielded. And yeah, we could go on and do the interviews. I think that's fine, but I think it's reasonable to now question, should we do that based on the information that we now have about who the candidates are? That's all. Uh, I disagree with that, Darren. I, sure. I, I think that we have the, pro I, I, I can't even, first, I, I can't even believe that we're having a discussion about whether we should interview candidates. I, 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 it might be impression we, we look, look foolish anyway. <laughs> We advertise. We get we get press uh, uh, involved in all things. We, we go through all that. We, we 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 have a subcommittee. We blah 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 blah, and then we're going to vote. <laughs> I, I, I think, in my well, opinion, I, I think I think we have a process. We said we were going to go with the process. Uh, I think we we have a search committee. The search committee came up with two candidates. I think we're absolutely obligated, without looking foolish, to, to give those those candidates. Uh, an opportunity to come before us. Coupled with that, I agree, agree that they're, they're local candidates, so it isn't like we're flying to San Diego, okay? Well, look at that, they have to fly here. I mean, I, I just think it's a no brainer. I don't even want to have this conversation, to be honest with you. We have two recommendations from the search committee. It should be coming before us, and then we should decide after an interview with those, those people what we want to do. That's my opinion. I, I, I don't understand why we're going to have a discussion on this. R Regina. I agree fully with what Carrie said, but, but part of the process, Al, is that this committee can decide whether or not it wants to interview the people recommended. And just because you have a process doesn't mean you have to have interviews. We had a process once before that yielded absolutely no candidates. Then we had to have another process. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to have interviews. You can't be wedded to that. I've been in education a long look time. I think, that, to not I think have that's. Interviews. I've been in education a long time. And honor by that's the most. The idea of 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 having a superintendent without going through an interview process of the school committee. I I, I can imagine any school any school committee in the Commonwealth that would think that that's a good idea, or any. I can't imagine any professional who who would then if. Uh, come and put in an application to this region to say, I ain't gonna put an application. Those those guys up there, they, they maybe go, they maybe go jump through hoops for X amount of weeks, and then they then they make a decision. Why do I buy going through this? That's my opinion. I, I think we should I, interview I, I, them I, I, purely. I am sitting here. Dan and then. Okay. Yes. Dan and then Steve. Chris so. also. Okay, Dan. <laughs> So I, I have personal knowledge that the search committee didn't consider this question of how to recommend to this body to how to proceed. Um, but my question is for Steve as chair of the search committee, whether you have a comfort level with sharing your sense of the committee with respect to whether they might have had an opinion on it. I, I would say the committee was <coughs> was very conflicted as to what they thought was best for the district and what was the best process. That I think a lot of us could see multiple perspectives in the various arguments and the various options. That there was at times a desire to just advance one candidate, at times there was a desire to advance two candidates. Uh, the other thing I would say is we did vote 7-0 to mention that we have a strong internal candidate in the advertisement and that was mentioned in the public discussions. And this was something that the search committee discussed briefly. This is something future school committees might want to consider in terms of how they do advertisements. We were fortunate that we still got strong candidates applying. 
but we only had five candidates. The search committee, I think, did a good job evaluating those candidates and providing options for this transition committee. And then the transition committee now, knowing what it knows about the district needs and knowing what it knows about the candidates, can decide how much additional information does this committee need before it feels comfortable to vote. And it might be we need to do interviews and site visits. It might be we just need to do interviews. It might be we don't need any additional information. So Chris? Yeah, I, ju I just was going to come on an else point. I think certainly if you have a, a pool where you don't get a qualified second candidate, you wouldn't go through the last step of the process. We're, we were lucky enough to get a second candidate that passed through the search committee and seems quite qualified. And, um, you know, so that in those circumstances, you may have a point, but there are certain circumstances where you just wouldn't bother doing an interview. So I, I don't think that as a general statement that's accurate, but it's, it's a tough call um, here. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say anymore because I think, you know, talking too much at a public hearing is it's a little odd mm -hmm. as you're about to approach an interview. Mm-hmm. Or, or not. <laughs> right. okay. Any other discussion on the on the motion before we vote? The motion that was moved and seconded was to move forward with conducting interviews with the two candidates. Was that moved and seconded? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I didn't remember. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Yeah, I. The, Carrie, you, you yeah, I did. Okay. did yeah. Um, n nays. Motion passes five two. All right. I'm going to get back to my conference. Yes, uh, Steve Miller. Uh, Feel better. Needs to make a quick drive to Boston now. Um, the police he's, he's going to head quick drive. Seriously? Valid speed. Yeah. We'll also do it. Um, so, yes. <laughs> so next steps, based on those next steps, um, we will reach out to the two candidates and arrange for um, interview dates. So we'll need to figure out the times that are amenable for the committee and for the candidates. And then... We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna need to find time to to do that as well. So I think that's something where, if First if we are meeting on the 27th, perhaps <coughs> that's a part of what we're doing on the 27th. Okay. I, I and then, the yeah. Um, so, process. so thoughts on that, um, Regina? Um, did, I'm sorry, okay. Joe. What, what thoughts on that? So <laughs> the question was the question was question development, preparing for the interviews, oh, yeah. along with the, the timing of the interviews. The question is how we go about that. Delegate to the uh, search committee? I think the, the, the questions are really ours to ask. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable delegating them to the search committee. To even create a draft or well, I guess, or do we not have time to go through a draft process, get it to us and then uh, have us an opportunity to have some feedback? I think we probably also have some sets of draft questions that we've used in the past that might be a good template. Mm -hmm. All right, so at our next meeting on the 27th, we can plan to develop questions and our interviews will be scheduled for shortly thereafter. Does that make sense to everybody? I don't think we should develop questions yeah, publicly. That doesn't okay. make any sense. Okay. Can we not meet on Friday? Um, mm -hmm. I cannot meet this Friday. Okay. However, I would trust the committee completely to to do what I agree with Carrie though we shouldn't develop those questions publicly it should be a subcommittee or something where people submit questions to you and you compile them but to do it publicly then they're out there Would before anybody comes yeah. to an interview why don't we send questions to you okay for, you know and, and then I will compile you, those yeah for okay. use during interviews that we schedule for as soon as we and can is, what are we doing here we are developing a set of questions that will be asked during interviews with the two candidates. And in order to develop that set of questions, uh, the process will be members of the committee submit those questions to me, and then they will be used during the interview 
with those candidates. I believe that's what the, com the will of the committee so was. It's quite scripted. It's just a set of questions that usually one person asks, and it's not a freewheeling conversation in my experience. Um, Interviewing. We're not going to go around the table and, and have individual uh, members of the committee ask the candidates questions? If it's a question written down on a piece of paper, maybe we can share the responsibility, right. but the last time, that, the two times that I've been involved, it's been those questions, one or two, usually one person asking them and everybody listening to the response. There was some time, Carrie, I remember you were involved in one or more of them. For, for people to follow up a little, mm -hmm. or was it all? Yeah. yeah, no, I think the idea, Al, is that you're asking each candidate the same questions. Right, right. You want some consistency, but there's absolutely like a follow-up question. Yeah. Can I have no problem with, with I understand, yes, both questions, yeah. both candidates, both questions. Mm -hmm. Are the candidates informed of the questions prior to the, to the interview? No. no. Mm -mm. So we submit the questions to you, mm -hmm. then and then I will compile them into a list of questions right. that will and be you, asked. And you ask the questions to the candidate. Each candidate will get the same questions. Mm -hmm. And then if we choose, we could follow up on, on one of the questions individually. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. There's an MASC document that talks about question formation that was distributed to the search committee. I think that, uh, I think that we could distribute that among ourselves mm -hmm. and, and give a better sense of what kinds of questions we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And also any questions that shouldn't be asked. That's always right. good to review off limit topics. All Can right. You edit the questions, Joe. Yes. I yes. I have the authority to edit the questions, but I think prior to editing a question, I would speak with the person who wanted to ask the question and make sure that either it was clarified appropriately or that, um, if necessary, it was brought before the committee so that. If a question was somehow not being allowed in, we would be able to discuss why. Better not edit one of them on, buddy. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have a dis we're gonna have a discussion about it. Yeah. My only concern is timing. You know, I know part of the reason the search committee turned this back to us was to expedite, and so mm -hmm. you know, I, it it's probably unavoidable at this point that this slips into April, but I think that as little into April as possible would be good. That's the only reason I suggest an extra meeting to try to to get through things faster than waiting until the 27th. But it may be we can do legwork beforehand. I think the well, key is to the key is to schedule the interviews. Right. And so hopefully the, inter the interviews can be scheduled for next week in the month of March. Um, Carrie. Another way to do it would be to go back to the group, you, me, and Steve, who developed the materials to send out and just charge the subset with coming up with the questions. Yeah. And then, you know, any suggestions you have could go to, you know, still go to Joe, but then there would be, you know, a small group of people actually just refining the questions. And that's another way to do it. And that way you don't have to have a meeting. You don't have to schedule a meeting. Is that a public you. body? Yes. Yeah, that would be a public meeting. So. Public meeting. Yeah. Okay. So sending them to Joe. Okay. All right. So we, I, I will reach out to the two candidates to try to find times as soon as possible, which, which for me would be um, days next week. I'll coordinate that with Jonathan to try to figure out when we can be present for those. Um, so that we can try to get them scheduled for as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And those are public interviews? Yes. Those will be open open meetings, public interviews. Yep. Uh, okay. And uh, Joe, you want us to email you our questions? Yes. Email the questions to me, and I will get that pack of mater that material from MASC and get that out to you tomorrow morning so that um, if that can help guide question formation or making sure to know what cannot be asked. Um, That'll happen you know, tomorrow. Okay. Anything else on that topic? All right. Uh, announcements, upcoming events of interest. Does anybody have some upcoming events, things that they want to bring up? I already mentioned mine last week. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, though. So. Uh, Upcoming meetings, as I mentioned, March 27th, um, 6 p.m., so next week, one week from now. 
uh, is our next meeting. Uh, following that, we have um, a date uh, with the Williamstown Finance Committee, and if committee members want that posted as a transition committee meeting, um, we can definitely do that. Uh, I would say if people reach out to me, let me know if you want to be there, if enough people want to be there, um, I will make sure that it's posted as, a, as an interaction with the Williamstown Finance Committee. We Can also I just ask a question? Would mm -hmm. you like members of the committee to be there just as a show of support in both towns to the fi for the Finance Committee presentations? I think it's always a good idea. But Where do they meet? Where does the Williamstown, Williamstown Town Hall? All right, but so reach out to me if you're interested in, in attending, and uh, hopefully you will, and hopefully we'll post that meeting for the 28th. Um, Shouldn't we just post it? Can we just post it in that way? Encourage we can just post it. Okay. I've, I've, been, I've been accused before of posting too many meetings, so I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive to that, but I gotcha. agree that... Okay. that By Jonathan? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there have been people who have said, well, you know, do I need to show up for it now? Is it posted? Uh, yeah. okay. um, no. And then April 5th and April 26th, we do have a Lanesboro Finance Committee meeting that's coming up um, that's not on here yet, but I'll make sure that people are aware and we will post it. It is, it is after that. It, it's not next week. Why are we meeting with them? If the budget is already set. To present the budget as approved by the committee. Wish they would have been here. Hmm? Wish they would have been here. They would have heard it. All right. Um, do we... Do we need a an executive session? Not for negotiations. Okay. Uh, so we're going to strike that from the agenda. Uh, would somebody like to move a motion to adjourn? So moved. I should beat Al to it. <laughs> <laughs> Al, do you want to second it? I'll second it. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 6-0.